<sighs> this virus, man. You found a side quest! I've been playing a lot of Mario Kart 8 Deluxe lately on the Switch, and like the majority, it is no doubt the best Mario Kart experience I've ever played. The selection of racers is expansive, the kart customization in combination with the character you select allows for nearly endless possibilities when it comes to catering to your specific playstyle in kart racers. Most of the power-ups are here, even these f***ing power-ups. The opponent AI has never been more balanced, but don't let that make you underestimate them, because even at 100cc, you're gonna have your work cut out for you. And the track design has arguably never been better. Although, I'm still a little salty that Maple Treeway, Daisy Cruiser, and Coconut Mall didn't come back as retro tracks. Neither did Mario Kart 7's Rainbow Road. What the heck, Nintendo? That's like the best one! Anyways, as much as I'd like to gush all over Mario Kart 8 Deluxe and explain why it's the best one, I believe it's only appropriate to go right back to the start. Super Mario Kart for the Super Nintendo. How well does it hold up in this day and age, and especially in comparison to the rest of the series? Hello everyone, Alec Elger, the Sidequestian gentleman here, and Super Mario Kart is a game I'm a little mixed on. I mean, I still like it to an extent, but after playing it recently, it most definitely suffers from first game syndrome. So, I've played all of the Mario Kart games. This may be a little known fact, but I've been a fan of the Mario Kart series since my teenage days, where I would steal my sister's pink Nintendo DS Lite while she was at her friend's house, and if I wasn't playing New Super Mario Brothers, which she also owned, it was most likely Mario Kart DS. Then I got the Wii version of Mario Kart for my birthday when we got the Wii for Christmas, and for the longest time it was by far my favorite Mario Kart before 8 came out, and when I dabbled into to retro gaming through sailing the seven seas, if you know what I mean. That's when I finally played Super Mario Kart 64 and Super Circuit. Yeah, despite owning a Nintendo 64, we never had Mario Kart 64. I know that's a bit blasphemous because that's pretty much the game everyone is expected to have in their N64 collection. However, I was always more of a Diddy Kong Racing kind of guy, and because I wasn't as big on racers as my dad and my sister, I just didn't really seek out Mario Kart 64. At least not until, like, high school, which is like 12 years later. Mario Kart 7 and Double Dash, however, while I did have fun with them when I played them, they were the last entries I played, and I only clocked in less than 10 hours in them, so my opinion on them has yet to be updated. I just remember 7 outdoing the Wii game, and Double Dash annoying me with the partner power-up system, but because I'm hearing Double Dash is a fan favorite, I don't think I know enough about the game to really have a finalized opinion on it. So, what is the point of this trip through memory lane? Well, in addition to flexing my Mario Kart fan muscles, I will be talking about Super Mario Kart, but I don't want to misrepresent my perspective, because while I do want to judge this game in a vacuum, I do have later entries to compare aspects to. I know this may annoy some viewers, but we're in 2020. I think I'm going to judge it by today's standards. If it's still fun, then it's fun. No problem. But if it's not fun because of some issues, I'm going to point them out. Developed by Nintendo EAD under the direction of Tadashi Suriyama and Hideki Kono, with Super Mario series creator Shigeru Miyamoto serving as a producer. Believe it or not, the first few months of development, they just wanted to make a Mode 7 racing game with split-screen multiplayer. Adding in the Mario elements didn't come until three months after development began, and even though it's not Nintendo's first kart racing game, heck, not even the first one on the Super Nintendo, as that had F-Zero since launch. But unlike F-Zero, they really wanted some multiplayer aspects featured, like what they would do for the Grand Prix and Battle modes of Super Mario Kart. That's not to say there's no single player content. There is, and that's how I played Super Mario Kart 98% of the time. This is actually the game I have the least multiplayer experience with. And I promise it's not because I don't have any friends. I do. Seriously, shut up. I know what you were thinking. 
It's just that my friends would much rather play literally any other Mario Kart game that's not Super Circuit. And when playing through the Flower, Mushroom, and Star Cups on the Grand Prix, you'll see why. Here is footage of the best tracks from Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. You can tell where the objects are in relation to your environment, and the set pieces make the tracks feel all the more dynamic, which helps with immersion. There's inclines, hills, ramps, flying objects, basically things that are pretty much impossible on Super Nintendo hardware. At least not until the Super FX chip was made, which generates not sprites, not pre-rendered 3D sprites, but actual 3D objects. Although to be fair, I'd much rather play Super Mario Kart any day over Stunt Racer FX. Seriously, that game has aged about as well as a glass of milk that fermented over the past 20 years. The point is, these tracks are flat looking. To give credit where credit is due, the game is mostly designed around these shortcomings, but there's no beating around the bush when saying how flat these tracks are and how it just looks a lot simpler than what came after. Hell, even Super Circuit looks a lot less flat than Super Mario Kart. But despite this, I don't think it outright ruins the game. I often forget that it's flat, but it's just like comparing the level design of Super Mario Bros. to literally any of the sequels that aren't lost levels. But here's why despite the flat design, they still work fine as racetracks. I mean, the earlier ones are a lot more open with grass texture slowing you down while the pavement provides normal speed. It's simple, tried and true racing game design, and those who never played a kart racer will figure this out quickly that the game punishes players who go off-road. So far, so good. But some of the more complex levels start throwing in obstacles such as deep water or bombless pits, which serves the same function. And if the goal of the race is to get to the finish line first ahead of the other racers, the last thing you want to do is lose precious time. And that's exactly what happens if you fall into a bombless pit or go off-road. You don't lose lives or anything like you do in F-Zero. Those few seconds you've lost could have been the difference between first and second place or even fourth place. And that sense of needing to master these tracks not only makes these simple looking tracks more complex than what meets the eye, it makes them engaging on their own merits, even if later Mario Karts did this concept better. So all in all, without the Mario items, it would be a standard engaging racing game, right? But now, for the items, this is where the kart racing genre pretty much started. It's not just about being the fastest, you also have to be the smartest on the track. Like, drive over these flat mystery boxes and you will be given a random item, like the green shell, banana, thunderbolt, red shell, cape feather, invincibility star, and of course the mushroom. The bananas are something you can aim forward or leave behind, and colliding into one will spin you out temporarily, which comes in handy especially if you want to take out tailgating opponents. The red shell is really nice because it homes in on opponents and temporarily knocks them out, but they can only be aimed forward. The green shell is simpler, except it doesn't home in and requires either precision aiming at the kart racer, or you can hope for it to ricochet off the walls and hit a target, and hopefully you're not in the way. Sometimes holding a shell works as a shield, and unlike the red shell, it can be aimed forward and backwards, sometimes making it more beneficial to you, especially when you're in first place, and want to stay in first place. The nice thing about these is that they're not impossible to dodge, and it comes as no surprise that these shells have since become a serious series mainstay, just like the boost mushrooms, and these provide a boost for the player. But this can also be a double-edged sword in the more bombless pit-heavy courses, meaning it's not just a free-for-all boost session, and the Starman power-up works as a speed increaser and temporary invulnerability to other weapons and racers. Hell, it even provides touch damage to racers up ahead, but again, it's one of those items you can only get at the lower rankings on the track. Oh, and I cannot forget the one thing it had over 64 and Double Dash, the coin mechanic. I love how your kart racer gets better acceleration the more coins you hold, but you do lose these coins if you get hit or fall down a bombless pit. I mean, they are plentiful in the racetrack, don't get me wrong, but like the mystery boxes, once you collect one, it's collected for the rest of the race, furthering the incentive to keep your coins and use the mystery box items wisely. This is one of the main reasons I like Super Mario Kart, despite it seemingly looking like it can't possibly compare to later entries, because unlike many of the later entries, the items items are balanced to a point where it doesn't hinder other players just because somebody didn't get good. 
I'm sorry, but the blue shell introduced in Mario Kart 64 is the worst addition to the series. Not only is there no way to deflect it, but it punishes the player for being first. Like, I'm so sorry you suck at the game so much you need to be coddled with your little baby blue shell and knock a first placer back a few places just for being good at the game. And you bet your ass me and my friends always ban the blue shell whenever we have a multiplayer match because whoever uses a blue shell is going to get a controller thrown at their head. Like, what the hell am I supposed to do? Stay in second place until the final lap? <laughs> that. The worst items, however, are the feather and the lightning bolt. The lightning bolt shrinks all the other opponents except for the user, and the feather, it just makes your cart jump real high. I mean, that does come in handy for shortcuts, but again, it's pretty situational. So the presence of fair offensive and defensive items with nothing resembling the blue shell is Super Mario Kart's ultimate leg up over the other entries. In fact, it's probably the only leg up it has over subsequent entries. And this is where most of the praise will be given because there's still a lot to go over. Because did you know that sometimes the CPU has their own abilities that you have no access to even if you're playing as these characters? Yeah, I just found out about that recently and it's kind of bull <laughs> Like, big deal if Yoshi leaves behind an egg, it's pretty much a banana substitute anyways. But for some reason, Peach and Toad are able to leave behind poison mushrooms that shrink you temporarily and Bowser for some reason has this moving fireball that moves left and right in place. Well, so much for completely fair item balancing. Anyways, that's just one aspect of the core experience because the other is the Grand Prix, which is what most players like myself will spend most of their time on. The Grand Prix mode is interesting because you only select the 50 and 100cc difficulty options at the start, and those two cc's have the mushroom, flower, and star cups, with 100cc adding in a fourth cup being the special cup. I know some players would much rather have all the modes unlocked right at the start, but I like having a goal to work towards as a player. And each cup gets progressively harder and harder, but the problem with these cups is how often they rehash stage themes and even designs. For example, there's 20 tracks total, and of those, there's only six different themes with only one never being recycled. Just to give a general idea, there are four Mario circuits, three donut planes, three Bowser castles, three ghost valleys, two Cocoa Islands, two Koopa beaches, two vanilla lakes, and one Rainbow Road. Now, each one of those has a different layout to be fair, with the Donut Plains tracks easily being my favorites in the game because it has shortcuts and progressively gets covered in water, adding to different visual variety and even obstacle variety. I also like the Koopa Beaches for being short and sweet, with the unique fish enemies serving as obstacles, making it more forgivable due to the second version not having much to call its own. And even though the Mario circuits are nothing more than sand and pavement, the warp pipes and slick oil spills kept these tracks interesting enough, but Ghost Valley, did we really need three of these? It's such a boring course that gets progressively worse. I don't mind the bottomless pits, but there's not much in terms of variety. Same goes for the three Bowser castles. Like, it's cool that there's several different pathways with different boosters and ramps, but the sharp turns and thwomp obstacles in combination with the ever-present lava just makes it a bit of a boring set of tracks. As for the Vanilla Lake tracks, it's interesting that they added ice physics, but man, why couldn't they make these ice cubes stand like the warp pipes in Mario Circuit? Having these roadblocks flattened out makes this course more annoying than it has to be. Like, I can understand making the water look flat, but these ice cubes? Come on. And what can I say about Rainbow Road? It's my least favorite version of the road. Sure, it tests out your skills in the 100cc by making it so you have to avoid the thwomps, and the path is narrow enough so that it really is the hardest track in the game, and that in combination with the controls of the cars, it really is my least favorite track in the entire game. Although I do love the later revisions on Mario Kart 7 and 8. Like, you can select between 8 characters, each having different stats, so the controls aren't exactly one size fits all, as Mario and Luigi are the most well-rounded, having medium weight, handling, and acceleration, as well as high top speed. Peach and Yoshi have low handling, medium weight, and top speed, and high acceleration. As for Bowser and Donkey Kong Jr.? Oh, right, this was before Donkey Kong Country wrote DK Jr. out of existence. I always wondered what happened to him. Okay then. <laughs>
I'm sorry I asked. Anyways, they have low handling and acceleration, high weight, and very high top speed, making them my preferred characters. And as for the Toad and Koopa Troopa, they have high acceleration and handling, low weight, and low top speed. The different track designs entice me to play around with all of these character types, but I can safely say I am not that big on the control scheme. This was before the drift boosting was introduced in Mario Kart 64, which I'm fine with because I'm not at a disadvantage when no one else has it either, but the game really wants you to master drifting in itself for those sharp turn heavy later tracks, but the drifting feels way too slippery for its own good, especially in comparison to not just later installments but also racing games of the time. F-Zero, while it didn't control as well as later installments because it's hard to give a sense of weight to 2D sprites on a pseudo 3D environment, I was more comfortable drifting with all four vehicles in that game than I was with all eight characters in Super Mario Kart. It's not the worst when you do get used to it, but it's still either the worst feeling controls in the series or tied with Super Circuit, but despite the controls making some of the lighter tracks more aggravating, while a portion of them are decent for the most part, it comes as no surprise that when some of these tracks are remade in 3D for later installments, I have way more fun with those versions than I do the tracks they're based off of. So all in all, my updated perspective on Super Mario Kart is a lot less positive than it used to be. I mean, I love the coin mechanic, and I like how it has a good balance of items, and most of the courses are interesting enough with the obstacles that are present. And to give credit where credit is due, I really like the character sprites, even if I find the track's art style to be a bit basic for my liking. I always crack a smile at the sprite animations for the ranking screen, especially Donkey Kong Jr. And the music is very charming and uses just the right amount of MIDI instruments to remain timeless to this day. It has a very funky electronic style and is even varied in tone, like the Ghost Valley theme being more suspenseful and frantic, and Bowser's Castle being a harsher sounding composition. So there are some positives to the Super Mario Kart experience, even at its worst. But as I went through each cup from top to bottom, the track designs progressively got more annoying and the drifting controls really started to show their faults. I remember my initial review of it being much more positive, but that was back in 2014, whereas if I had any fun at all with the game, I gave it an instant high score regardless of how much more aggravating it got later on. Growing up is realizing that even with your own individual quality standards, not every game is awesome even from a developer and publisher that consistently makes good games. Hell, even the multiplayer is lacking, like I honestly believe that in Super Mario Kart, the best multiplayer experience is most definitely the Grand Prix because just watching my friend fall behind and try to get ahead of these CPU racers, there's just so much chaos that ensues. And the battle mode does add some variety, but the flat obstacles don't make this mode that interesting as the opponent can always see you and you can always see your opponent. And if you weren't a fan of the controls to begin with, <laughs> let's just say battle mode will remind you why. Because, let me just say, there's a lot of corners designed around each map, and you will find yourself getting stuck in them. And the thing is, you can't exactly reverse your car. You basically have to keep bumping into the wall until you nudge your way out into the open space. And it's just so arduous. Like, why do I have to do this in the first place? Why couldn't they design a reverse option? My friend Red Shy Guy, who is seen in the second player footage, he said it best. It's like doing 15 push-ups just to get out of a corner. I will say this about battle mode, I had the most fun when we both launch a bunch of green shells and because they don't really disappear until they hit something like another shell, or a cart maybe, eventually the arena will be filled with ricocheting green shells and you and your friend are just there trying to avoid it. Look at this footage for example, this is freaking chaos and I love it. So as a whole, while some regard this game as a masterpiece, I would probably rank it much lower than I used to. I may or may not like it more or less than 64 or Super Circuit, but it's definitely one of my least favorite entries in the Mario Kart series. Yeah, it's definitely no longer my top 10 favorite Super Nintendo games. I can think of at least a dozen games I'd play any day over Super Mario Kart. I don't hate it. I like it still, because I have the option to just play the 50cc like I used to, but now that I went up the higher difficulties, the problems really rear their ugly face in front of you, and I just think it's an above average experience. Overall, Super Mario Kart is okay. 
Super Mario Kart may have introduced kart racing with multiplayer and items as a subgenre that not only sequels expand upon, but also other franchises like Diddy Kong Racing, Lego Racers, Pac-Man World Rally, and Crash Team Racing. And I suppose Garfield Kart has its own twist on the subgenre as well. I mean, it is the only kart racer with a lasagna cup. Yeah, that's right, Mario Kart. Get on Garfield's level. Super Mario Kart is a game I wholeheartedly respect as a part of gaming history, but I respect it way more than I do enjoy it as a game, unfortunately. And that is the case with First Game Syndrome, where the first entry is the start of something great, but sometimes just isn't as great as later installments make it out to be. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching this retrospective. I really had fun making this, even if I didn't enjoy this game as much as I was hoping I would enjoy it. But until next episode, remember to stay awesome.